Great. Yep. You're good to go. Man. Good. Um, well, cool. I'm really excited. I appreciate you reaching out to me. On yeah, man. And, uh, yeah, the video you shared, um, when I asked you to send that to me, that was, I was sitting there watching it and, and I've learned about infinity banking for a while. Um, but I, to kind of see how it, I don't know. Did you do that visual? Was that yours? Yeah, that's, that was actually me on zoom on the whiteboard with this style, <laughs> drawing that out. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That was really good. Man. I was like, dang, this is, this is the you know, visual. You can talk about it all day. By the way. Yeah. The numbers. I mean, I've done ones where it's just literally spreadsheets and it's going through the numbers on the spreadsheets for different, uh, using it for car buying and just buying holds versus a fix and flip situation too. And when you actually see the numbers, it, it's a little more meaningful than just saying, Hey, you can become your own bank. Like, no, that's great. Tell me, before <laughs> that real quick, tell me just a, a brief about your background. You sure. Know. So, so actually my background is in this. I'm, I'm going to, I'm recording this if that's okay. So. Yeah, that's, that's completely fine. I'm happy. I'm happy to be a resource. Yeah. <laughs> um, so my background is actually in medicine. So before I got into the world of financial consulting, I was um, sports medicine. Obviously, I married a military a military woman, so we bounced around the world. So I had to be pretty flexible with what I did. But I ran into the CEO of Drive Planning, which is my firm, and fell in love with what we did. And then from there, I just kind of was hungry and hungry and hungry for information. And this is just one of the one of the things that we do for folks. So Drive Planning is a service financial consulting firm. We work with real estate investors, we work with W2 employees, we work with business owners, doesn't matter what the industry is. And we just provide alternate financial consultation strategies and just more creativity than here's a stock, here's a bond, here's right, a right, right. bonus. Are you, are you using this specific product, kind of what we are talking about in the sense of like this life insurance or to invest in real estate? Are you using this product for, for your investment needs right now or what? Yeah. So I, I do have one. So I've actually got a couple on my kids for their college planning purposes. And then my wife and I each have one just on our one for just the life insurance purpose, but it also doubles as our, what we call a private reserve or the infinite bank and stuff. So yeah, I, I am currently using it. Mm-hmm. Personally. This is a way that do you still use like a traditional savings or checking account? Um, so well? right now, yes, yes, I do. So for me, I honestly, I just learned about all of this, this whole world and all these things about a year ago. And so setting it up, it just takes time to, from in real estate terms, it takes time to build up that equity piece sure. inside, inside the vehicle or inside the, the insurance policy, right? Just like it would any home, any, any multifamily property. But um, so right now it's a smaller piece of my overall investing strategy or just overall wealth plan. Um, but it will become a bigger piece of it. So like the CEO of the firm, he's got multiple uh, life insurance policies. And so it just, they just function as bank accounts. Some of them are his investing ones. Some of those are, is his strictly his real estate ones. Some of it is just like his emergency funds. Some of it is, Hey, I'm, we had a really big year this year. I need a place to house this stuff very safely. And he just opens up another policy and throws it in there. So you can have multiple, multiple policies and it's just, does it make sense for how you move money and how you actually, I think the more, more important thing when setting it up is how much money do you have come in on a regular basis for a W2 employee, it's more of a longer term play, but for someone who's got their own business, who has big months, little months, big months, little months, it actually is more beneficial. I would say it's more applicable more immediately for someone in that situation. Okay, so cool. So let's back up a little bit because I, I want to try to understand this. And I think I get this at a higher level, but I want to kind of break it down so that I can explain it more. And so I don't, I am not currently using this, but after seeing your video, I'm thinking to myself, why am I not? Like, I have <laughs> policies their whole life, and I'm thinking, why am I not using these more? And I think part of it is because I, I know it, but I'm like, okay, I'm getting yeah. an application of how to use this more effectively. So let's back up a little bit. So we're talking about, using a life insurance policy as a means to store cash in order to invest in real estate. Is that, is that a simple way to explain that? That's, yeah, that is a, that is a good use for it. That's one use for it, but that is a very good use for it. Yeah. I mean, of course there's multiple things you can do, with yeah. it, but that's, that's what I kind of want to focus in on here. So Absolutely. let's kind of talk about the basics. Mm-hmm. Um, where do you like the, are we talking about whole life or term life here? So yeah, so uh, technically, technically we're talking permanent life. Okay. So whole life is a type of permanent life. So permanent, so term and permanent are the two umbrellas. Term is just kind of a contract. It expires. You send them money. 
Actually, the insurance companies love term policies because they get rich off of them a lot more than they do whole life. I mean, it's like or, renting or buying a condo, right? You that's can exactly buy right. It or you can rent it. Yeah. Yeah. And so whole life is the, if we look at the very basic definition of infinite banking, uh, whole life is the, the product that is used for it. So we as a firm typically use what's called an indexed universal life policy. And because it tracks with the stock market, still has a guaranteed no loss provision, but you also trend upward. So you can make, instead of just making 5% or 6%, you could make up to 10%. So there's a varying range. It, it averages out to be about 6 or 7%. But over the last 10 years, you would have you would have made some really good money with the bull run on the index fund. So what about when the index funds got below the, let's say, 5% mark? Say that again? What about if the index funds were to drop below? Let's say we go under. Oh, yeah. So so the range is 2.5% to 10.5% right now. So you never go below a certain range. Um, if we're really getting into the nitty-gritty, it's technically a 0%, but it's a 0% on the, on the, the premium dollars in. That it never get that never lost. So there's surrender value, there's um, accumulation value, and then there's death benefit. The zero percent is on your accumulated value, and then the cash value gets credited that two and a half percent. Now, at some point in time, both of those are going to be the same, um, but typically, I just say you no loss provision. So you have a floor that you're never going to go below. If the stock market goes into a landslide, you're still either going to not lose or make a little bit, depending on how much cash value you have built up in there. Okay, cool. So, um, and what does it take? Like how much cash does it take to get started on one of these policies? Yeah. So it is an insurance buy. This is like one of the, it's the most common question to ask. And it is, so it's an insurance product. So it's based off of what is the death benefit It's based off of how old are you? What's your health history? Are you a smoker? So there's a lot of factors that play into it and it's also how you want to use it. So for, Someone who's looking to use it more immediately, I would say within the first three years, I mean, you're looking at kind of a lot of money. I mean, if you're looking to do a down payment on a house using it, if you're looking to buy a house outright, you're looking at quite a bit of money, like six figures. So let's looking- assume, okay, let's assume that we have an investor who has a hundred K right mm-hmm. in cash and they're ready to invest in a real estate project. Mm-hmm. I mean, is, is a, you know, should I guess my question is, okay, we have this 100K here. Should we look to invest in this life insurance policy in order to do this, you know, this concept we're talking about? We'll get into the concept here in a minute, I'm sure, but yeah. we're kind of talking, let's, let's start with 100K cash. Yeah, so if you, <clears throat> excuse me, so if you have $100,000 in, in a bank account, here's, here's the biggest thing. There is, there is certain years where you don't have 100% access to that money once you start investing. So okay. if you were to put that $100,000, and again, you'd have to, Make sure the death benefit is lower. If you're really using it for investing, you have to make sure that you're working with a specialist that has the lower death benefit and the highest uh, cash value rating. So make sure it's kind of bare bones policy. What I mean by that is there's not underlying writers. There's not different kind of term coverages. There's all these little things that agents typically will just throw in there because it's death benefit focused. But if you kind of chip away at that, the death benefit is a smaller component and the cash value is a bigger component. So if you throw, if you throw in $100,000 into a policy, and let's say if that was the top you could, because the government dictates how much you can throw into here, because it grows tax-free and it can distribute tax-free. So the government sets the limit at the bottom and the insurance company sets the floor based on the, the death benefit and based off the cost. So if you were at the very tip top at $100,000 that first year, you may only have access to $30,000 or $45,000, depending on the company that you go with. Um, now that next year, if you throw in a little bit more, maybe you, you really peel back and you say, hey, I'm only going to throw you know, $5,000 in or 10000 in. You may have access to fifty five dollars or 65000 Again, it depends on your crediting system. It depends on which the product it also depends on the company, but there is, there is that, I guess, catch up period, if, if you will. So just, just like if you were to buy a house, if you didn't buy the house outright, there would be that equity build up period while you're making payments down, you're building up equity into the home. It's kind of a similar for people that are involved with real, real estate. It's an easier way to kind of conceptualize. Is it like a percentage of the, of the cash that I have invested in this thing or um, like when, if I, like when will I be able to access that entire 100 K in order to, right? Like, so, and are we saying, when we say access it, meaning I can pull that, I have a hundred K into it. Can I borrow immediately up to the hundred K? You're saying that's that third, that 30 to 40 K in first year is how much I can lean up against that 30 to 40 K or that's how much I can pull out of that 30 K? Both. 
both. So you help, it, it functions similar to a Roth where you always have access to the cost basis as long as it's available to you. So eventually, if you overfund it, the, the hyper fund methodology, mm -hmm. uh, at about seven years, you're going to exceed the amount of premium dollars that you've put in, meaning the, machine, the, the investment vehicle is going to be producing more money than it's going to cost you to put in around seven years. So up to that point, you're always, you're never going to have access to that, the 100% of everything that you put in there. It will, you know, stair step up. And that's, that's why this vehicle isn't for people that are looking to go real, real fast. Um, that's why it's not a, not a great option for them. Okay. But uh, to answer your question, let's say it's $40,000 that you have available. Yes. You can either pull that out and withdraw that as long as that's not, um, as long as that's not interest earned, meaning the tax free growth in there, it, it comes out tax free, just like a Roth and you have access to your cost basis, but you can also loan up, you can loan against that money as well. And typically at what, 5%? What is that? Uh, right now, again, depends on, uh, not all companies, not all products are created equal, but the ones that I've seen, we use anywhere from 4.25 to four and a half. And can you lock that in? Yes, that's fixed. And it's unstructured repayment. So that's another really important thing because it's your money. You dictate, and again, it depends on the company. Uh, you can dictate when you make contributions back, does that go to principal, does that go to interest, or does that go to neither and it just goes into the policy? So you can kind of dictate, at the end of the video, I think I shared that there's different ways to pay it back over time. And so if you, if you structure it through a business, like you're investing, and you just go interest only payments, that's a tax deduction for you. And I'm big on tax deductions. So, so right. um, I'm gonna put you on the spot here for a second. I don't even know if you can do this, but we do have a whiteboard thing on this. Um, yeah. Would it be possible for you to maybe draw this out, like kind of in the, kind of like you did on the YouTube video? Is that yeah, abs absolutely? I, I want you to draw it for me, and then I can ask. You, as I see it, I think I can ask you some more questions as well. How is that? Can you see that? Yep. All right. Get this stuff out the way. Oh, this is money. Let's go. Let's yeah, I know. Go. I know. I love. <laughs> I, I, listen, anytime you want to talk about this, yeah, <laughs> you no, talk about this all day. I think this is a really helpful product and I think it would help a lot of folks who, you know. Yeah. You know. I, I mean, it really, it's, it comes down to, and I tell this to everybody, it comes down to what you're trying to be for. And, and for me, if you're going to save anyway, it doesn't have to be you just completely deal 180 and now this is all you're saving in. It can graduate to being your primary form of saving, but if you always are saving or, or peeling off some of that cash flow, go into your next real estate deal, consider starting one of these that will eventually overtake your, you know, high yielding savings accounts, barely keep up with inflation. Uh, I know we're, we're at like one and a half percent right now, but that's, those are always kind of. Well, let me ask you this before you draw this, why this versa, like what are the other benefits of, let's say I'm just putting, you know, want to hold cash for an investment. Why store cash here versus high savings? What are the other benefits? Man, I am glad you asked. That is, um, so I actually, there's a whole other video series that I put together. There's 12 components that make up the ideal, what we call the private reserve, most commonly more known as infinite banking. So you can use, uh, you know, 401ks, heel locks, uh, Roth IRAs, um, uh, marginal on stock, stock portfolios, all these different vehicles that you can use to kind of do this. But when it comes down to the 12 key components, um, let me see if I can rattle them off real quick. You have uh, tax-free growth. You have tax-free distribution through the loan through the loan out process, which is huge. I mean, you talk about retirement planning, you can live tax-free in retirement. It is credit protected in most states. It's credit protected. So if uh, you, know, you hit someone and they come and sue you, or if you get tied up in litigation, they don't have access to this money. I use the example of OJ Simpson. He's got one of these and that's why he gets to go still play golf course. He was getting more rich in prison than anybody else. This is privately held money. Okay. Uh, oh, for real estate investors, this is huge. If you have an outstanding collateralized loan, it's not viewed as a negative thing on your balance sheet, right? It doesn't affect credit. You can see, you can be as leveraged up on your life insurance policy as you want to be or can be. And you can still walk into a bank or a lender and still get hard money or, or a mortgage on another property that you're trying to. Um, Okay. For bigger multifamily investments, sometimes lenders want to see a life insurance on one or multiple um, partners in the deal to make sure that just in case something happens to you, that there's, you know, your life is insured to kind of cover out any outstanding mortgages. Uh, additional benefits in the form of you can structure disability insurance and obviously the death benefits involved in there. Um, 
long-term care and accelerated death benefits. So as you get older, medical bills start piling up. Even even with medical insurance, I, I go on and on about the additional benefits. Um, credit protected is a really important one. Uh, the unstructured, the guaranteed growth, which is huge, the guaranteed loan options. So they can't tell you no. If you have equity in there, they cannot tell you no. You call them up, send an email, say, I'd like this money wired to me. They cannot deny you the money that you have available to you. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Uh, and unstructured loan repayments. So you're not held to stock market crashes or the real estate market crashes. They're not coming after your property. They're not coming after you. You just, it's your money. You have the collateral there and ready to go. Um, and it's just kind of a wash. So right. there's, a, there's a lot of benefits. Again, it's a, the preservation mindset in chapter one, two, and three. It's really long. It's, they're, they're, they're all like 17 minutes long, but uh, it, it kind of breaks on the the comparison. The, the third chapter breaks down the comparison of all the different vehicles you can use. Yeah, I'm going to get you to write. Maybe you could write down that your YouTube channel, or whatever, on this sure. so we can see it at the end. Yeah, absolutely. So okay, yeah. Let's let's look at this. Let's look at this picture. Your you know your your drawings are pretty good. I'm not going to say <laughs> words for them, but they are helpful. So yeah, they uh they could they could use some help. I'm not I'm not Picasso, or maybe I am Picasso because they are pretty obscure. Well, and let let's keep in mind like let's keep in mind the person I think that maybe I am or the people that I'm working with too. Like this isn't you know someone who does have cash, you know anywhere between fifty to two hundred k. They're looking to invest that cash. Right now, it's most likely either sitting in savings, high yield savings account, or an IRA account. Um, you know, maybe a Roth, four hundred one k, most likely as well. Yeah. Kind of those are probably the four places that that cash is sitting in currently. Of course, yeah. So when it comes to qualified plans like traditional IRAs and four hundred one ks, getting the money out of those vehicles and into something like this. It, can be a little bit tricky. Obviously, you have to consider the tax ramifications and, and the penalties and stuff. There, there are certain moves to mitigate the penalties, but again, that's age dependent and how much money's in there and stuff. So, um, you know, let's let's take it from someone who's either just an avid saver in just a standard vehicle, whether it's a savings account or a high yielding savings account or even a Roth for that matter. Okay. So, what I always like to say, it's it's a bucket, and this bucket is ironclad and it comes with a nice lid on top. So you always have a tube that goes and connects into the top. So but just like just like water, money can evaporate. So this funnel going right into the top of this tube, it's guaranteed to remain in there. It's safe, it's safe, it's safe. But typically when you say safe, it usually comes with, hey, uh, it's not making very much. Now this vehicle is a little bit different. So just like anything, it doesn't matter where you house your money. If it's in a 401k or in stocks, uh, your market fluctuations and inflations and admin fees are going to chip away at the money. If it's in a high yielding savings account or savings account, inflation is going to chip away at that money. Um, if it's in if it's in uh, real estate, you're kind of tied to the real estate fluctuations and all that. So there's always some kind of underlying downside to any kind of where you house your wealth. This vehicle has what's called a, a cost, an insurance cost, and so out the bottom, out of the bottom, comes the term life insurance cost. So just to keep the policy in force to ensure your life, there is a cost associated with this product. Now, when you're talking permanent life insurance, life insurance, there is an overpayment that is made. And this overpayment builds up what's called cash value and in real estate terms, equity. It is the amount of money that you have access to, whether it is drawing out or whether it is loaning or borrowing against. So, now, what's, what's valuable of having your money housed in here, like we talked about, the, the credit protected and all that, but it's guaranteed growth. It's consistently winning year over year. I always like to, uh, and the percentage will vary, and this, again, disclaimer, everything I'm saying here, not all insurance companies are created equal, not all insurance products are created equal, and not all insurance agents are created equal when you're structuring this. Um, if you're going true infinite banking concept, the stipulations are a specific mutual fund or mutually held company, so not a stock company, meaning the mutually held company is the policy owners. So me and you, if we have life insurance policies, we are shareholders in that company because we have policies. The company doesn't answer to shareholders that are stock market tied stuff or stock market tied access uh, assets. The policy owners are the people that control the company theoretically drive the success of the company. 
Um, and, and obviously it's got to be structured a certain way. Um, you don't just call up your life insurance agent and say, Hey, I'd like a whole life policy. I mean, they're going to, honestly, they're going to get, <laughs> they're going to get dollar signs rolling in their eyeballs if they hear that. Um, because there is a lot of commission typically made on this, but when structured well, and, and you have an agent that's working well, they leave a lot of commission on board because the important thing for investors is the cash value. Mm -hmm. All right. So I also want to point out, you're not going to get rich just doing this. That's why it's got to be integrated with, you know, working with you, <laughs> getting into some multifamily deals. You have to use it appropriately. Right. 98. So let's say 95% of all life insurance policies never pay out, meaning the death benefit never gets paid out because the policy lapses. Most of those are term policies. Some are even uh, whole life or permanent life insurance. But the more interesting thing to me is something that you mentioned 98% of life insurance policies, permanent life insurance policies have never been borrowed against or loaned out against. So it means people just don't understand how to do it. And it is complicated. It's not super easy, but 90, only 2% of people are actively using their life insurance policy to enhance their investing. So I'm, gosh, I'm, so, I'm really happy to be here talking with you to, to be able to do this. So I digress. So you have your underlying costs associated here. You have a percentage of guaranteed growth tax-free every year. And this is privately held company. So if you're saving for college, it's not viewed on your assets. It doesn't disqualify you from financial uh, being able to apply for financial aid. There's a lot of reasons to house this money in a very privately held uh, organization. So you have this tax-free growth year over year and every month or every year you're making contributions as well because it, um, it is a life insurance policy. So you're paying premiums, but you can also elect to pay a max amount and a minimum amount. So the minimum amount is what we talked about here. Okay. Max amount is set by the U S government. And that's always a funny thing the, the government always puts limitations on things that are very advantageous. I feel, especially when we're talking about tax, uh, tax implication wise. And so there's this big range and typically this range is pretty large. Typically this range is pretty large. You may have a, a minimum payment of uh, $10,000 annually. And then you'll have a maximum of like $30,000. So there's a wide, wide range that you can throw in there. So the more you get to this max limit, the higher your cash value is going to, to become year over year. Um, and over time, again, this is going to continue to generate and generate and generate money. All right. So that's kind of the baseline infinite banking concept. That's how it gets set up. Uh, again, it's, it's not something that you just dump in and then you loan out against. I mean, personally, I, let's see, just to give you some hard numbers for me on mine alone, um, I did a maximum dump in of uh, $32,000 and I have access to $9,000 of it. So that's just some hard numbers for, for people. Yeah, to take. Right off the get go, 32, right, nine to yes, right, right off, right off the get go. Um, and you can borrow up to nine. That's as much as you can borrow currently. Correct. So yeah, for that, the available cash value, the, the company, depending on the company, it's anywhere from 90 to 95% of your cash value. Okay. The reason they build in that buffer that is just in case you don't make any interest payments on it, uh, they have, they have that insurance buffer. So it'll, the, the, the lien will just increase with the insurance on there. And that, it, I'm sorry, that didn't make sense. The lien will increase with the interest that you didn't pay back if you weren't, if you didn't elect to make any interest payments on that, on that lien. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's up to, up to 95% is the highest amount that I've ever, I've ever seen. So, and, and we use that, we moved in, we moved all over, all over the, the, the country, we moved from Hawaii to Atlanta, Atlanta to Florida. So it's been, been pretty crazy, but we finally got in, settled into our house and our house needed some work. And so instead of paying cash or you know, getting a loan out, we just borrowed against ourselves to redo the backyard, put some pavers in, get an awning, do some work around the house, get a security system. It totaled out to be about $5,000 worth of work. And now we just make monthly payments back to ourselves. But the thing is, we just, we've always controlled that principle. Let me get into that. So let me do a new page here. Let's go back to on that fee that, that fee that you have to pay kind of be, is that when you're putting in that minimum or that maximum, um, how much on an annual basis is when I put in, let's say I'm putting in 15 K a year into this mm -hmm. policy now, or let's say you could put that 32 K in every year. Mm -hmm. How much of that actually gets paid towards like the fees of, you know, the right. Yeah. So let's go back to that. So um, again, that's going to be dependent on, on your age and your health and everything. So if you're just a, a younger 
healthier person. Uh, I, I imagine that the fees are going to be somewhere around 0.075%. And then the term cost is, um, let's say the 32,000, 32 K is the max you can pay. Uh, probably again, just to spitball in here, anywhere from five to 12,000, depending on your, depending on your health. If that okay. makes sense. Uh, so it's, it's, it's obviously not cheap. Fee, that five to 12 K or what is that? That five to 12 K. What are you saying? Is that, that, that is your, that is the cost of, um, that is the cost of the insurance. So that's the, your, to keep the insur underlying insurance going forever. That's the cost that it's going to cost you annually. annually. Okay. Again, that, that just, that depends. Okay. That I, I, I always, I'm always leery. It's not because I'm trying to hide the numbers or the costs. I just don't know. <laughs> yeah, range is fine. Yeah. Uh, and it can, and it can get much more expensive, you know, for folks that are in their fifties, maybe looking to, to move their money into a safe vehicle, moving into retirement. I mean, you can, you could see, I've seen it as high as $50,000 annually um, of right. just what they call target premium. It's just so you have guaranteed growth and the insurance uh, product stays in force um, forever. So, so I, think, I think this is probably what scares a lot of people away from this, right? Because when you say, okay, I'm going to put my cash in here, right? So this is where you got to convince me now because I put in this 32K. I can only really bar, I can only use nine of that right now. And I have to pay five to 12K in fees plus another. Um, or you sorry, I say calls for an insurance plus, you know, 0.075% of the fee. I'm thinking to myself, why, why am I giving up this money when I could just go invest that? Right. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, and that is, that is probably one of the hardest questions to answer. And the best thing I can say to people is don't think so black and white. What I mean is you're not just going to take all of your life savings. Like, Hey, I'm working really hard to, and I'm grinding every day and I'm saving up all this money so I can go put that money to work for me. That's great. But you're putting all that money into one vehicle. Let's say real estate for this example, why not take a small chunk of it and start this? And then as that investment money, I, I can't actually see myself. So I hope you can see my hands I can. Uh, as that, as that investment money is peeling back eight or 10%, maybe some of that cash flow goes into con contributions into your infinite bank. And so over time, your infinite bank is working for you while your money's out here working for you as well. And then over time, your infinite bank becomes your source of, Hey, I've got this 30 grand. Like you do current state. Now you have it in a savings account, maybe in five to seven years, you now have an infinite bank that you're going to, Hey, I've got 30,000, a hundred thousand, 200,000 I can go invest in. So it's one of those things that you should start. You don't have to start maximally, although it is, it kind of really gets the ball rolling. If you do, uh, if you are actively investing, a very important thing for you is being liquid. And so I don't want to take that away from folks because you're out there trying to make money doing this investing. So why not take a small sliver of it or a chunk of it and start building up your private reserve, building up your infinite bank to then replace how you have been saving in the past. Mm -hmm. And that, that was what I would say. It's, it's black and white. Like, all right, it's either I do this maximally or I don't do it all. It doesn't have to be that way. Right. If this is, this is a product. If you're just looking at it like a product, it's not any good. It's just not good. Right. Yes. Is, do you have the insurance? Yes. Do you have the ability to leverage? Yes. But it, if this is it for you, it's not any good. It has to be a piece of your overall plan. It can't just be your plan. If okay. that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So um, now to, again, to get back into the components here, the important part if people who don't understand leverage find this very difficult to grasp. So if you do understand leverage, it's um, it's just, it's makes it a little bit easier to explain. So let's just take a hundred thousand dollars because math usually works out. So you have a hundred thousand dollars and you want to invest or let's just say buy this property out here. And again, it's, these numbers are so inaccurate in today's market. <laughs> let's just say you have $50,000. Now you have put a lien on half of your tank. Just like if you were to buy a car and you were to get the financing from the bank, the bank has a lien on your vehicle. You stop making payments, the bank takes your car. In this situation, the lien is the cash value. And so they don't have a lien on your house. The house is yours because technically from the, the seller of the home, you've paid cash because that's cash in hand. Now, what are your options from here? And people are like, well, why wouldn't I just buy that house outright? Well, that's true. But now you have $50,000 in equity in this property, okay? 
and you also have $100,000 that remains in force. So the principal, the underlying principal never decreases when you borrow against it. So what we talked about on the first page is you have that guaranteed growth, let's just call it 5%. So you're going to make $5,000 inside this tank passively. And then hopefully you're working with, uh, you're working with a, a rock star and you're going to get some appreciation over here um, or cash over here making that money. So you have that $50,000 in two places at once, two places at once. Um, now that's how the, the loaning works. That's how the leveraging out works. And so just understand that the, the underlying principle is always in your control. And as you're making payments back to yourself, if you elect to, some of it's going to reduce the lien. So you're gaining more control over your money again. Some of it's going to an interest payment. Again, we talked about it's four and a half percent. And then if you elect to, some of it's going just kind of on the top here, on top of that $100,000. And then keep in mind, you have premium payments that you're making that are also increasing this number as well. Right. Cool? Yeah. Good stuff. Now, it's, it's some people are like, well, I see it for investing purposes, but I don't really understand it for um, like buying depreciating assets like, uh, like a car. It, obviously, it's not as powerful because you're not getting that uninterrupted compounding effect here. Mm -hmm. um, but what you, I mean, you, you, do, you do continue to get increases in here. But what it does is instead of just giving $30,000 to the dealership, you just have $30,000 with you while you have your car. And, and although you're going to spend money to have that car, you're going to end up uh, closer to even than you were if you were just to buy the car outright. And there's, there's a video on that one as well that breaks down buying cash, um, doing the, doing a traditional financing and then using the uh, infinite banking for car buying. So I don't want to, well, let's, let's stay focused on real estate. Right, right, right. No, I thought your, the syndication example you used was really helpful in the sense that if, you know, cause I mean, maybe you can start a new page and walk through that scenario of, you know, sure. you're having to pay that four and a half percent interest on this money, mm -hmm. you're making 8%. So you would think, well, why, why would I, in a sense, borrow at four and a half in order to make eight. Yeah. Um, but then you come into the example, well, we're making 5% of this money. Can you maybe draw that example out as well? Of course. Of course. Yeah. That's, that's great. So again, let's go back to the tank. All right. And then you have your apartment complex syndication over here. All right. Now I believe the numbers we had $200,000. And this over here is going to make you 8% annually. Right? Is that, is that accurate? Is that is it typically yeah, what good. you see? Okay, good. Good. And uh, let's just say a five year hold. And so that's, so over time is where you're really going to see that, that thing really, really good improvement. So as I said, for the saver, okay, let's saver, you know, you build up, you build up, you build up, you build up, and then you spend down to invest. And then you're making that, that 8% annually. And then you get that balloon payment back at the end, plus your underlying principal. So you, you know, if you had your 200,000, you made 40 K over that, over that, uh, those years. And so now you're left with 240,000. So that's great. You made, you made that money back and you're able to put it to work for you. And that's not a bad way to do it. This is just a little more efficiently uh, saving done more efficiently. So again, you've taken your $100,000 out and you've borrowed against it. So you have 100 K. All right. So again, like every as a sponsor, let's say who's receiving money from an investor, mm -hmm. that K to me just looks like cash. From that investor. That's, exactly, that's exactly right. It is when, when this, when these people call up there, the insurance company and say, Hey, I'd like to uh, collateralize a loan for a hundred thousand dollars. They say, great. Depending on the company, uh, historically a lot of the uh, insurance companies, especially the smaller ones have pretty bad customer service. That's why you kind of find that delicate balance between big, but not too big <laughs> to help with customer service. But uh, as let's say, if I was investing with you, I would just pay, I would call my insurance company they would, they would wire me the money. And then for me, it would just be a, either a wire transfer bag of money in, in hand to you. So for you as the recipient of it, as the person putting on the syndication, it's just cash. Okay. It's just cash. Mm -hmm. All right. And so we've got four and a half percent right there. That's what that money is going to cost you. And so year over year, it's going to cost you $4,500 to use that a hundred thousand dollars. Uh, and I think that ends up being what twenty two thousand five hundred dollars, yeah, twenty two thousand five hundred dollars over that five years, uh, and you're going to make eight percent on your hundred thousand dollars over five years, which totals to forty thousand dollars. And so, it, just kind of looking at it 
overview, you're kind of like, what the heck, man? That's seventeen thousand five hundred dollars. That's terrible. I just made forty thousand in the other, in the other situation. So again, this is including that nice little balloon balloon bonus you get at the at the very end. So that is what you get. Obviously, not also not also taking into account capital gains. So it's probably a little bit less than that. But again, if you structure it correctly, that's twenty-two thousand five hundred dollars of tax deductibility, and never take, never disregard that as well. So that can be a tax deduction structured correctly. Inside here, though, let's gonna go. Let's go back with that five percent increase. That's a five percent increase over five years um, of tax-free growth on your two hundred thousand dollars, and so you're already getting a 0.5 percent arbitrage. But it's even better because the 0.5% is only on the $100,000. The 5% is on the $200,000. And again, that's why you have to be on a, that's why you have to be with a good company because some companies don't allow that to occur either. So okay. just make sure there's, there's a lot of moving parts with this stuff. Just be careful. Really good uh, I don't, I don't want any hate mail from anybody saying this is such a scam. You lied. Right. What question would you ask if you were talking to, you know, someone like yourself and is to make sure that, Hey, the idea is I'm trying to do this and invest in real estate. What question would you ask to make sure that that's happening. The five percent is on the two hundred k, in the exactly. Yeah. Uh, that that is it. Wow, that's a great question. So, um, questions are, uh, you know, what is the term that's escaping my mind? There's an actual there's an actual term for it. It's a like an internal. Uh, in oh man, so you can also ask: Is there a drawdown effect? Uh, that is typically the verbiage I use. So, and they'll say, "What's that?" And when you explain, <laughs> is my underlying principle drawn down? when I take a collateralized loan. If they say yes or I don't know, maybe look for somebody else. Right. Um, but if gosh, there, there's a about actual, their product, right? Then, yeah. Right. And that and that's okay because most life agents they want to serve their clients better. So they have contracts with like a thousand different companies because they want to provide the lowest cost to people. Um, and that's why we work with a very select group of insurance companies that we kind of know the ins and outs of how they operate. We've got existing relationships with their customer service. So we just kind of act as intermediaries to make sure that everyone is getting exactly what they need that fits into their overall plan. And that's, I, I would honestly, I wouldn't get rich just doing this. There's not a lot of money for me in just doing this. That's why I'm also an investor. That's why I do other things to serve my clients. So um, that's, and that's just um, another way. If someone's just doing this, it's kind of like, well, what else are you doing, man? <laughs> what, what else are you doing? Right. So yeah, so a draw, uh, internal drawdown. Um, when I take out a loan, does that lower my overall cash value amount? Um, you know, and they'll say, well, it actually goes on the death benefit. There's a lot of different ways to, to, to say it. Um, but what you want to make sure is the crediting interest, the interest crediting goes on the total amount of the accumulated value. Cool. Okay. That's awesome. So we're making 5% of this 200 K we're paying 4.5% of this 100 K. Yeah. So let me see, let me get my compounder out here because I don't remember what the numbers actually were. Cause when you actually see the hard numbers, it really makes, really makes a difference. So your starting balance is $200,000. You're going to make 5% every year. Um, and that's over five years. And let's just say you're not going to make any more contributions to it. Just the money just in and flows back. So over, over that, over those years, that total, that 200,000, not including any of this, not including any of this, this total inside is now going to be 2,055, 205,000. 261 and 84 cents. And that is tax free. Now you only have access to, cause keep in mind you have a lien on 100,000 of it. So you only have access to 155,261. Um, but after five years, you're going to get your hundred K back per the investment agreement. And that's going to go to reducing the lien on that hundred thousand. So at that five year mark, that $100,000 is then just, is going back into your private reserve. So instead of just coming back into your bank account, it's going back in your private reserve. And so instead of sitting with $240,000, you're now sitting with $255,261,000. Right. Plus 17,500. Now, depending on the terms of your life insurance policy, this, this amount could go into the tank. Uh, if you've kind of maxed out your limit for that year, 
um, know that that $17,500 either goes into another account or it goes into another life insurance policy or it goes into uh, the next investment opportunity, whatever it is for you. So uh, what you can do, what you do with that $17,500 is really kind of is up to you. I would always encourage you to, if this is your investing money, if this is your investing dollars, make sure it's uh, housed safely, it's growing efficiently, and you don't lose access to it. And also, you said that 4.5% on that 100K is also, you, that's something you can write off as well too, right? Mm-hmm. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So for a lot of a lot of folks that we work with, I make sure that if they're getting into if they're moving into that, hey, I want to become an investor, we always kind of structure some kind of business entity or business modeling for them and so they can reap the tax benefits of being an investor and not just, hey, I'm making more money now, I'm going to lose more money. So yeah, when you structure it correctly, whether it's through a business or whether it's uh, specifically borrowed as a, as a business opportunity or a business loan um, from yourself, that $22,500 is a tax deduction. That, that interest rate is tax, tax deductible. Just okay. like a mortgage. Yeah, no, that's really helpful. Okay, this is really good. Okay, I got a couple questions and then let's wrap this thing up. Um, first question is most people probably, especially if, you know, they're, they're wise, they've made some good money, most people have a financial advisor. Imagine I have two whole life insurance policies, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, but I know, like, well, I shouldn't say I know, but I didn't, you know, I didn't, know how to set this up beforehand. So what questions do I need to go back and ask my financial advisor? Sure. I'm say, hey, I, I want this, right? I want to begin to use my whole life insurance policy in order to invest in real estate. It, it, can I convert what I currently have in order to do this? Or I need, a, I need a whole different policy? How does that work? Sure. So you have, you have multiple options. So the questions you should ask are, um, you know, what is my, what's my current cash value looking like? So I, and I don't know how long you've had them, how the, had the whole life policies. Um, but if you, so the whole life, the terminology is different. So when you have a whole life policy, you have what's called a contract premium it means you pay this much for either X amount of time or for your entire life. And if you don't, the policy goes away. So that, that for me, that to me puts a lot of stress into the life insurance policy. Mm-hmm. You can do an overpayment, which increases your cash value a lot more. But first question would be, what's my cash value looking like on both my policies? Um, kind of, and, and how long have you had them? Have you had them for like a couple of years? Have you had them for like 10 years? Well, like one, for example, was a whole life that I think my parents started on when I was a kid, mm. right? So that's been- Good parents. <laughs> Good parents. Right? And then I had another one that we just started after I got married. So one's 20 plus years. The other one is probably two years. So you have, you have some pretty good cash value and some fairly good cash value built up into there. I would imagine at least on the 22 year, uh, the 22 year old one, because of the, the dividends pay on this year, or year over year. Uh, so find out how much cash value you have. And now you have from there, you have two options. Either you can take two independent loans from both of those. If there's cash value and use them just the same, you just contact the, Hey, can I get the money? Hey, can I get the money? They wire it into your account. And then from your account, it's just cash for wherever you're investing. Or you can do similar to the 1031 exchange in real estate. It's, I believe, oh man, again, 1035, I believe. It's a 1035 rollover or 1035 yeah. roll-in. Uh, it's a way to take existing life insurance policies that have cash value and you either roll, you have multiple options, again, depending on the company. You can either roll all of the cash value into, in, into a new policy at your current attained age and your current attained health. Um, or you can use the existing cash value to pay the premium payments on the life insurance policy. So for someone who had it uh, when they were very young, that's built up quite a bit, but they're, Hey, I'm like making a lot more money now. I want to be able to dump more in there to house it safely. Uh, let me get a higher ceiling on my tank instead mm-hmm. of where it is. You can roll over the cash value and that lowers the overall cost because it's just pre-existing cash value. Um, or you make premium payments to get the new policy in force and that cash value then just becomes available to you. So because it's a way to on the policy will determine what you're seeing, like how much you can actually contribute. Yeah. To yeah. And so, and I know some of the groups that we use, they have uh, what's called a flex life policy and then they have peak life policy. So the peak life's typically going, it's the death benefit starts at $1 million of death benefit and then goes up from there. The focus being, um, 
good solid good solid death benefit for family coverage and, and everything and for real estate investors if your partner is in a real estate investor it's nice to have just in case something happens to you that just covers all the mortgages and it's just mm -hmm. kind of like your permission slip but uh, so peak life starts at a million dollars and goes up but it also has a very good crediting consistent crediting system on cash value so it's real more cash value focused the flex life the flex life is interesting and i really like the flex life because it starts anywhere from uh, hundred thousand dollars and it can go up to whatever you want but here's where you when you work with a really good specialist here's what you do you get a, you find that sweet spot where the death benefit is high enough where you can make good contributions and the cash value is increasing then once you have the policy rolling and enforced say five years maybe seven years depending on how much you're contributing you actually lower the death benefit kind of stair step the death benefit down. Now what that does is it allows you to stop making contributions. You can't make any contributions or the whole tax implication problem shows up, but you lower the death benefit down. What that does is it drives down. If we go back to that, that first picture, it drives this cost down and increases the cash value accumulation because now you funded it. Let's just say you funded it at a $750,000 death benefit for seven years, but now you've lowered it to say, Three hundred and seventy-eight thousand dollars, and now the cost is much, much lower. But you still have all this cash value that's year over year increasing for you. And again, not all policies allow you to do that. Not all companies allow you to do that, uh, but good ones do. So that that's a, that's a good play for more long term. Hmm. And the one thing I would say, out of the twelve things that make up the ideal um, the private reserve, so tax deductible contributions are the one things that it does not have. So like 401k, people like 401k because the money in is tax deductible. Um, there are specific ways. And most, if you talk to an insurance company, they would deny this. Do not do this because it's we don't like saying that you can do it. it you can't do it. It's called premium financing, which that is another, we'll get back, <laughs> we'll circle back for the next video on that one. But it is a way to, for people that have, uh, that are assuming a lot of large amounts in estates, uh, when people have maybe selling off a business or just are paying way too much on tax and are higher net worth individuals. It's a way to immensely cut your tax bill mm -hmm. and grow the cash value in this thing just mm -hmm. through the roof really fast. So there are alternate plays, but again, it's, it's one of those things, the more you have, the more you can do. Um, for folks, it's, it's not super cheap. Obviously if you're, if your financial world is kind of a wreck, this is not something, it's not a mat. It's not magic. It's just math. You know, it's that, that old statement. It's, this isn't, this, this can be life changing if you integrate it appropriately. And like to, to your point, um, it's not, uh, it's not something that happens overnight. It shouldn't be something you just go all into all, you know, right away. Right. If you, but if for you, most people who have, but so what I'm seeing here, for most people who can afford a life insurance policy, which are anybody who's investing in syndication, yeah, definitely will be able to. Yeah, this is something that, and they're already most likely have a some type of life insurance policy that they're paying or they're putting money into. This is just simply a way to leverage that account in order to invest. In, I mean, in order to make more sense in your investments. Is that correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. Either you're paying whatever it is already to your whole life or term life, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Would you recommend having this? And like you said, let's say, okay, I'm, I'm my profile of an investor, let's say anywhere from 30 to, to 45 years old, right? So we're, we, all of us have families in case something was happening to us. We're normally the breadwinners in our family. So we need a pot, you know, we need a big policy in order to cover something. If something was happening to us. So do you recommend having this with the lower death benefit, like you said, and something else mm. that we're not leveraging? How do you normally help investors think about it? Sure. Yeah. And, and it's very, very dependent. Typically, if, if you can wrap it up into one where you have good death benefit and you have good cash value accumulation, you have that economic value assessed amount. So basically your age times your current salary. Um, I'm sorry, your, your, the working years remaining times your current salary is your economic value to your family. And so whatever your age is to 65, that's how the court dictates it. But it's a good measure for how much death benefit should you have kind of in the ballpark. Uh, that number can get really big. Though. So, but whatever you and your family kind of feel comfortable with and whatever, you know, we see based off of analysis. Uh, there are some people, there are ways to structure a, a permanent life insurance policy. And this is a good way for people that are just starting out. You can have a chunk of it, let's say $250,000 of 
permanent life insurance, and that's what's generating cash value, but you also have to the side of it, 250,000 of term policy as well. So it's, they're hand in hand. And what this allows you to do is after you start making more money, you can convert chunks of that term to make it more permanent, more permanent, more permanent over time. Yeah, so then you end up- More money you're, you're making, you're saving, you're starting to invest. You don't yeah. need this massive death benefit, right? Um, yeah. yeah. Wow, okay, this is really, really helpful. Um, so let's end this, at least the recording part. And uh, let me ask you, so guys are kind of saying, okay, I want to get started in this, or I got more questions. Or, hey, I asked my financial advisor, and he doesn't really know what he's talking about. <laughs> uh, maybe first you could go back and write those videos. Let's, let's write those down. And then just kind of the next steps of, you know, either had, yeah, next steps on how to get started on something like this. Uh, sure, sure. I mean, I, and I want to make this very clear. If you're working with a financial advisor, like, it, it, a lot of people in the financial service industry will say like, Oh yeah, like I know how to do it. Cause there's like, it's some weird thing where they have to know all the answers and they get kind of defensive about it. I do not mind coming in to, to talk or just be kind of a third party on anything like that. So nationally, like are you nationally? Across? Sure. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, and I'm not looking to, to steal anybody's business. In fact, our whole burn is predicated off of a very, very collaborative. If people engage with us, everybody that's involved really comes out on top. So if there's ever a chance to, to talk or educate with somebody about structuring this appropriately, I'm happy to talk with anybody. I'm not trying to steal anybody's clients. I'm just trying to make sure that this, I mean, this is a, this is really kind of a game changer for investors. So it should be more well known than it is, but um, you know, other people out there that are doing it, um, some are very specific with who they work with, but a guy named Garrett Gunderson, I don't know if you're familiar with that name. Uh, Garrett Gunderson has a company called Wealth Factory. He focuses very heavily on um, business owners. Um, a guy by the name of MC Lobsher, he's the host of the Cashflow Ninja podcast. Uh, if you haven't listened to the Cashflow Ninja podcast, it's awesome. Um, he's a really good guy. He's what uh, I learned about the infinity banking concept, actually. Yeah, really. Yeah, I just had a the other day. That's funny. I when I first like I was talking a couple months into me joining up with my firm, I got to meet MC just kind of very randomly at uh, at an event, a training, a big training event on some some financial software, and had no idea who he was. And then I looked him up, and I was like, "Whoa, he's kind of." <laughs> <a real." laughs> MC, there's your shout out, man. You yeah, can MC is uh, seriously. I whether he knows it or not, he is a mentor of mine for sure. He's taught me a lot about this business. Um, than, than he probably realizes. So uh, let's see who else is doing stuff like this. Uh, what did you say Garrett Gunderson's company was? Wealth, what? Uh, Wealth Factory. Okay. So what's yours? What's yours? Let's wrap this yeah, up. So yeah, so Drive Planning, let me write that out. So Drive Planning is the name of my firm. Okay. I would say where we differ from MC's approach and Garrett's approach is we work with a much, much wider range of folks. So we have different alternative investments like uh, solar, solar funds and waste energy stuff, movie industry, uh, oil and gas. So um, if it's private, if it's more predictable or reliable, we like to kind of get involved with it. That's why we have multifamily and different kind of short-term rentals and help people get involved with real estate investing. Um, but our kind of our core is the financial analysis piece as well. So if you have trouble finding money to fund this, they're like, man, this is great. I don't have this kind of money. That's a very typical thing to say. Most people have more money than, than they know. So we go in and find just cash flow inefficiencies and help it redirect it. And sometimes it is an infinite banking concept. Sometimes it's not. So that's, that's kind of where we differentiate there. So driveplanning.com. Drive planning. Say that again. Are the YouTube videos here at drive planning? Yeah. So if you go to driveplanning.com, there is our YouTube channel up in the top right corner. It's a nice little red button. That's probably easier. I am a, I'm probably the only person that creates a bunch of content for the, for the channel. So, um, if you go on, there's not many views. So if you just type drive planning into the, uh, into the search bar on YouTube, probably wouldn't come up right now, but you can get to our YouTube channel through driveplanning.com. Well, I should uh, put some more, I'm going to promote some more views on it. I appreciate it. Really I appreciate it. It's, it's, it is great. Also, I'm going to put this on my YouTube channel. I'll also link your YouTube channel and mine so that people great. Oh man, I would appreciate that. That's, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, what else? I mean, if, if people have questions, I don't mind handing out my cell phone number. Um, they just know that if I don't have your number saved in my phone, I am probably not going to answer the first time. So shoot me a text. Uh, but I don't mind handing sending people out uh, my cell phone number. And then my email address is my first dot last name. So Anthony dot Ornella. at driveplanning.com. So 
Um, so last question is like, and just maybe sum this up. I'm looking to get started, reach out, but you know, I mean, what, what, some advice or tips and really trying to kind of that investor profile, you know, they're wanting to get in mm-hmm. We're after, after they kind of end this YouTube <laughs> play what's next. Yeah. Uh, things not to do, do not just Google life insurance policy as an investment. Okay. Because as an investment vehicle, it just gets absolutely eviscerated. And those people aren't necessarily wrong. Um, there are people, I mean, John D. Rockefeller, the Rockefeller family uses this as a big foundational piece of their whole family's wealth. So are they wrong? No, they're using it right. And it's all about how you use it and how you integrate it. So if you are product focused with this kind of stuff, it is not going to make sense and it's not going to be a good deal for you. So make sure it's integrated to what you're already doing or what you're trying to do. So uh, next steps is find somebody, find a specialist. Uh, there's another guy named that's who I'm thinking of, Patrick Donahoe, Don, Donahoe, Patrick Donahoe. Um, I, I don't know his company. He runs a podcast called, um, oh man, I can't remember his podcast either. I, he was on Mike Dillard's podcast. So if you search um, MikeDillard.com for his podcast with Patrick Donahoe, uh, Patrick's been doing it for years as well. He's, he's, he's very knowledgeable as well. And again, he's more of the traditional infinite banking strategy whole life. Uh, so, so next steps for people that are trying to get involved, go find somebody who specializes in this particular thing. Even if you're working with a financial advisor or planner or, or anybody like that, if they don't really know the ins and outs of it, hopefully they know somebody that is. So even if it's not you that seeks somebody out, but Hey, this is what I want to set up. You know, like if you're not a specialist or anyone in your you know, company is a specialist, would you please like reach out to some people and, and, you know, help me get this set up. So make sure that it's clear. Like you're a specialist. They could reach out to you with their financial advisor. If they need. Yeah, exactly. Or have their, yeah, have their financial advisor, you know, reach out to us as well, because this is, this just makes everybody's life better. I mean, if the financial advisor is helping you, the person invest, I mean, you can use this for stocks as well. I mean, you can use this for cryptocurrency as well. I mean, the whole buy, ho, buy low, sell high thing. Right. If your money's not tied to stock market or it's tied to real estate and everything goes to hell in handbasket, the people in 2008, 9, and 10 that won probably had this because they just borrowed their money against it, bought a bunch of stocks, bought a bunch of real estate, and enjoyed 10 years of a bull run on everything. And now we're probably selling off because the, the, you know, the crash is looming or the correction is looming right now. So they're probably, I mean, even Robert Kiyosaki said he's selling off more stuff right now than he ever has in his career. So typically, you, know, they, you keep saying it until it happens and then you're a genius, right? So. Right. Uh, but yeah, so find a specialist, find somebody that, that knows the ins and outs and has done this. And it really does this as a big piece of, of, of what they do. Um, and someone who's also not looking to sign you up immediately. All right, let's get started. Like send me all this information. Like there are certain, if you want to see hard numbers for your specific situation, that you're going to have to give your birth date. You're going to have to give like where you live. You're going to have to give some health history questions. So if you want to see real hard numbers, there are some information you're going to have to give. Um, but someone who's looking like, hey, let's fill out all this application like right now and we're going to get you set up and we're going to get this in run ready. And I'm like, oh, pump the brake, man. This is a long process. Like make sure that you feel good with the person that you work with, really. It's business is emotionally driven. So if you're never feeling comfortable with who you're dealing money-wise with, you're, you're never going to be happy with it. So make sure, you, make sure you like the person you're working with. Awesome. Anthony, I'm going to end the recording. Stay on the line here, but uh, thanks for, for showing all this. This is going to be really helpful, I think. It was an honor, man. Thank you so much for reaching out, too. This is great. Um.